sure we're recording the session. And thank you and welcome back to another of our webinar training series from Jane Irrigation. I'm Richard Restucia, Vice President of Water Management Solutions and uh, your host for another great session. Today's session is titled on drip. Now, uh, uh, great, great subject actually, you know, where this came from was I was attending a session a few years ago uh, for master gardeners and we had a gentleman talking about irrigation and really we had people asking questions for a good hour after and they were very specific to drip irrigation and what should I do in this situation and it became very apparent, you know, maybe for spray head irrigation, there is a right way in every situation almost. Uh, and with drip irrigation, there's a lot more variables. There's a lot more ability to use some creativity. There's a, uh, a lot more opportunity to use some problem solving skills. So with that, uh, we've got Andy Bellingeri. He's the national sales manager for Jane Irrigation, working the landscape and ET water uh, product lines for Jane. And Andy's a real expert when it comes to drip irrigation. Uh, you know, Andy uh, is a graduate of uh, BYU, the horticulture program there. Uh, coming out of college, he started working for Valleycrest, the largest landscape contractor in the nation at the time. And uh, he started as an uh, account manager, you know, working with teams in the landscape. He learned a lot about horticulture at BYU, but he learned a lot about plants and people and irrigation in the field at Valleycrest. Uh, we worked together at Valley Crest, and then Andy came over to uh, Jane uh, shortly after I did about five years ago, and uh, it's just, um, it's been amazing to watch the education he's built and the knowledge he's built on, uh, on drip irrigation. So with that, we're very fortunate to have Andy uh, talking about drip irrigation and, and these variables. So uh, Andy, welcome, and uh, uh, appreciate you taking time to spend our afternoon with us today. Yeah, well, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I appreciate the introduction as always. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of what I'll talk about today is, uh, you know, things we've learned along the way. Um, as a, a teenager, I was working for a landscape company in Las Vegas in the early 90s when Drip was first being introduced into, uh, into Las Vegas, late 80s, early 90s. And a lot of what we learned was, you know, we, we learned kind of by doing it wrong. And so hopefully what I am able to share with you today will help uh, everyone else out there maybe shorten, shorten the learning curve with DRIP or maybe improve a little bit on where they're at. And um, there's three key, uh, I guess, topics we want to focus on today. It's the, it's the what, the where, and the how. So the what, we're going to focus on what are some of the, the system basics of DRIP irrigation. This will be kind of a, a maybe a little bit of, of a basic review for a lot of you. Uh, then we'll get into where, where to place these uh, irrigation devices, where to, where to put the drip irrigation to optimize plant health. And that gets, uh, you know, from a skill set of maybe a little bit more um, uh, medium um, up there. And then we'll graduate into the how, how long to run it. And this might be a little advanced, but answers a question I get all the time is how much water does my landscape need? So we'll focus there on the, the what, the where, and the how. Um, but first, hey, Andy, that's really interesting. I just want to mention, you, you, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and a uh, gentleman on the podcast says, you know, people who don't know very much will tell you about their successes and how great they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, people who uh, are really great will tell you a lot about their failures and what they learn from those. So, uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to say that, uh, you know, you're going to use your experience, especially from uh, the early drip to... to us all learn today. That's great. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. So real quick, you know, there's always this debate between spray and drip. Everybody loves spray because they can see it working. Um, it's very easy to use. However, uh, there are a lot of disadvantages to spray. Number one, it's an old technology. Um, not quite as old as flood irrigation, but it's, it's an older technology. Because it's older, it's only about 50% efficient. And, uh, and I say, uh, you know, 50% is kind of uh, with a big asterisk next to it because out in the field, it might be only 30, 35% efficient. And that, that means uh, there's a lot of waste um, uh, due to a lack of efficiency, a lot of runoff, there's a lot of overspray. Uh, so it's a major disadvantage of spray, of, uh, spray irrigation. With drip irrigation, um, the advantages are it's very, very efficient, 95% efficient. 
it's a precision distribution of water. We don't have the, uh, the, uh, the overspray, the misting and so forth. Now, people do like to bring up some disadvantages of drip. One I get all the time is clogged emitters. We'll talk about how to avoid that. Usually that uh, clogged em emitter device or uh, situation is, is, is more user error. And then they say, well, drip irrigation is zero. It looks like this. This is what I get with drip irrigation. I get some gray rocks, a cow skull, and a wagon wheel. That's what, that's what people think of when they think of drip irrigation. And, that's, and that is uh, um, not always true. And I like to show these pictures. This is uh, four different pictures, all areas that are irrigated with drip irrigation. Drip irrigation not only can be efficient, but it can be very lush. And uh, I like this picture as well. This is from the, Den uh, the Denver Botanical Gardens. Um, uh, this, is, this is all done with drip irrigation as well. Andy, I had a question about that efficiency, right? Yep. So when I hear 50% efficient, maybe even 35 in some situations, right? We've all seen that. Um, so does that mean if I need an inch of water or I need 100 gallons of water today, I really need to put on two inches or 200 gallons? If you're 50% efficient, yeah, you're putting, you're wasting half, half the water you're applying is being wasted. I mean, that's that's the that's the efficient. So if it's if you're if you're only 30% efficient, that means seven out of every 10 gallons you put down is wasted. Yeah, that's just incredible to me, right? When you think about that waste, and I've I've scratched my uh, my brain a couple times trying to figure out another industry in which that waste is so bad, right? If I want a 12 ounce cup of coffee and I go to Starbucks, they don't pour me 24 ounces and 12 goes on the floor and I leave with my 12 paying for all 24. Um, I, I can't think of another industry. And so anyway, thanks for clarifying that for us. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So, um, so if we can, if we can start from that, that, you know, that, 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 groundwork, that baseline that, that uh, drip irrigation is efficient and we can have beautiful landscapes. And we'll move into, all right, what are the components I need in a drip irrigation system? Like I said, this is basic. You got a valve, you've got a filter, you've got a regulator. And then after that, you have the drip line. Um, the filter is key. When I hear about clogged nozzles, it usually is due to lack of filtration. And here's a picture showing how a, a filter works. Quick story, I was working with a contractor in Las Vegas. They called us out. They said, my emitter line is all plugged. I got out there, had them open the valve box to turn the valve on. Of course, they turned the valve on and the emitter line was all plugged. But sitting in the valve box next to the, the filter body was the screen filter itself completely plugged up. And the, the guy in the field said, yeah, two weeks ago stopped working. So I took this screen looking thing out. It was working great. And now it's all plugged up again. So filtration is key. You've got to have a good filter. <laughs> yeah, so true, right? How many times do we hear from customers? Uh, so have you cleaned your filter lately? And a very common response back is what filter? Yeah, yeah, you gotta have, <laughs> gotta have a filter. And of course, after that valve filter pressure regulator uh, combo, you get into your tubing, your distribution tubing. Um, it could be half inch, it could be three quarter inch. I don't think I've seen a lot of inch on the landscape. Half and three quarter, most common. And then you'll have a quarter inch um, um, spaghetti line that runs out to the plants. And that could be either with emitters or without emitters. Uh, if it's got emitters, we call it emitter line. If it doesn't have emitters, we call it blank tubing. Um, and that, uh, that becomes a key part of the, uh, the irrigation system as well. And I, you know, I won't spend a lot of time on these because they're basics. But uh, to tie all the tubing together, we have fittings. And I like to, if you're, as you're looking at this screen, this is a progression of fitting technology as you go from left to right. Lowest technology on the left, highest technology on the right. So you have this uh, 17 millimeter barb insert fitting. They're cheap, but tubing is known to blow apart. And the fitting in the middle, you got our compression fitting. It is a it is a, uh, it's used to be, it's only to be used with one size fitting, right? And that's why you see the blue ring, you'll see a black ring, green and yellow even as well. And then as we move over to the right, we have our power lock fitting, which uh, you can see in the illustration here how it works. The beauty of this power lock fitting is it is easy to install. It is a one size fits all. Uh, believe it or not, there is not just one size of half inch tubing. 
And this is just one of the weird things in irrigation. There are four sizes of half inch tubing, which is, uh, can get confusing. So having this power lock helps, helps, uh, help the guy build, uh, save time, save money, and it becomes a, a great cost savings device there. So, um, and this is a picture of why drip technology matters. You use the insert fitting, it blows apart, power lock fitting, it keeps it all together. So I like to show that there again, fairly basic. So Andy, if I'm, if I'm a maintenance contractor and I'm rolling up on a job and maybe I didn't do the installation, many of those jobs I didn't do the installation on, if I don't know what size tubing I have, I'm in trouble, right? Absolutely. You may have a 700, 600 tubing and you're trying to put a uh, 710, 620 fitting on, compression fitting. It goes on easy, but then you bury it up, right? You turn the system back on and it blows apart and you're back out there repairing it again, right? And so it, not only is it the, uh, the more time to actually do the repair, but it's doing the repair again and again and again. So having a uh, power lock fitting saves time multiple ways. Yeah, because they, they fit them all. They do, they do, that's right. Uh, you know, emission devices, you can see example of three different emission devices here. You see a button emitter, very typical. You can see adjustable shrubler, you see an octobubbler. The key to these emission devices is flow is measured in gallons per hour. And two other keys I'll mention, always choose pressure compensating for commercial landscape. It'll make your life easier. We can have a whole additional, uh, you know, 30 minute conversation on pressure compensation, but for today's purposes, always choose PC, pressure compensating. And then of course, filter and regulator are a must with our emission devices. And lastly, that I'll talk in the uh, system components here, the need to flush. You have a good filter to keep debris out, but you know, you make repairs, debris can still get inside the line or just uh, mineral deposits building up because of hard water can build up inside the lines, potentially could clog your emitters. You need a good uh, a flush system, either a manual flush with a figure eight that you see here or a, a end cap where you could take it apart, manually flush it, or with this picture on the left or on the bottom, these are automatic flush valves. Every time you turn the system on, it automatically flushes, allows uh, you to keep that system nice and clean and operating um, at peak efficiency. So, um, so and I have a question. You have to go back a slide, sorry. <laughs> right here. Sorry to be a pain here, but uh, so in this case, right, I think we see maybe mini PAP or supply line on that uh, octobubbler on the right hand right yeah. eight eight, uh, eight devices could be attached to that and then yeah. on the left is the shrubler right yeah how do you decide when to use a shrubler and when to use like a quarter inch uh, mini pep line uh, on, on a project what what do you use as your you know basic rules so i'm going to stick i'm going to speak specifically to commercial landscapes uh and it goes back to pressure compensating. This, this uh, quarter inch emitter line, and, or mini pep line as we call it, and those adjustable shrublers are non-pressure compensating. And the only time I would use those in a commercial landscape would be for, let's say pots, flower bowls, where you, you know it's, it's such a small area, uh, pressure compensating may not matter as much, but you also, you need, you need to uh, apply a large amount of water, you need to do it frequently, because of the nature of the plant material that's in there, typically annuals that uh, need to be watered every day have shallow root zones. That is where I would use a shrubler or a uh, quarter inch emitter line. Outside of that, everything else is going to be either a button emitter or emitter line, and both of those are going to be pressure compensating. Okay, all right, great. And the key there for the commercial guys is that, um, the, the pressure compensation, right? Same amount of water in all the plants and they'll be able to get longer runs. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. You get, you get equal amount of water and fertilizer to the plants and much longer runs. Yeah, good, good point there on the, on the, the length of run. So. So good. So uh, we've kind of established here then our, our, our what, right? This is what we use. Um, the, the, the next question then becomes, okay, I've got these emitters. Where do I put them? Uh, where do they get placed? And this becomes, uh, man, a, a pet peeve of mine. I see so often a, the scenarios where emitters are improperly placed, and because of that, plants fell. And because of that, people say, well, drip irrigation is no good. 
plants can't be as healthy. That's not true. Plants can be healthier than with spray irrigation, but you have to know where to put the emitters. Um, and, and to figure out where to put the emitters, we want to ask ourselves, I call the root cause analysis, analysis. We want to know where their roots are. As you see in this picture, you can see the, we have a tree here. You can see the drip line. Most people say irrigate at the drip line, but that's not always true. Roots can extend one and a half to four times beyond the drip line. And so we want to make sure we're putting the emission devices, the either emitter or emitter line, where the roots are. Uh, here's a bird's eye view of that same tree. You can see the green is the tree canopy, and we have roots coming all the way out here, all the way around, right? And imagine if, if a guy put a single emitter right next to the trunk of the tree, and the tree's never going to thrive, right? Or the shrub or whatever it is. We need to understand where the roots are. And uh, I think the problem happens. I think guys end up putting just one emitter because they see a design like this. They get a set of plans and it shows, hey, um, here's your tubing right here labeled A. Here's your emitter labeled B. Here's your quarter inch um, spaghetti line. Comes up out of the ground. You know, you have a typical point source install. And the guys think, okay, I guess I just need one emitter. And you end up with uh, plant material that ends up failing because you don't have enough water to do that. And th here's, a, here's an example of that. Here you see a single emitter per tree and you have trees that just aren't happy, right? You get uh, lack of vigor, just not doing well, not doing well at all. So uh, this scenario is wrong. This scenario is right. As you can see in this picture here, and this is just a cross section, we have an emitter placed across the entirety of the root zone. Therefore, the plant is healthier. You can see these trees look healthier, even though it's just a drawing. But uh, um, you were putting the water where the roots are, right? That becomes the key. Uh, designs then, you, so, you know, for designers, I don't know if you have any architects out here, this should be included in our designs. Not just the, the one-off showing how the emitters connect to the tubing and where it comes up out of the ground, but what is appropriate for the size of the shrub? How many emitters are needed? If it's a small shrub, it may need one or two. If it's a medium shrub, it may need three. And not just the size of the shrub at the time of planting, but we need to think mature size. What's gonna be the size of the root zone when it's mature? Let's make sure we put the emitters out there. Uh, another key on emitter placement, where to put it. This is kind of basic, but I see this mistake a lot as well on slopes. Uh, if you put water on the downhill side of the slope, more water runs down up here, doesn't get water. So uh, 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 on hillsides, especially on the perimeters of communities, I see a lot of drip irrigation, a lot of trees and shrubs, and there's a hill. Uh, having more emitters on the uphill side, maybe in a two to one ratio, uh, you know, gravity works, water runs downhill, and you'll end up with half healthier plant material as well. And this could be a point source emitter or it could be an inline emitter. And for uh, everybody out there right now who's thinking, well, when do I use point source? When do I use inline? If you visit Jane's website, uh, back in uh, April, we did a uh, presentation on point source versus inline. Go back, if it was recorded, you can watch it and you can learn uh, when it was appropriate to use point source, when it's appropriate to use inline. So, and you know, here's, a, uh, here, here's a scenario of using uh, inline drip in a, in a landscape. You could, uh, you could use that. Um, or you could use, if you go back a couple slides, a picture like this, where you have, this shows a bunch of uh, uh, point source emitters. You could do the same thing as this with uh, an inline emitter. Hey Andy, uh, I have a couple questions here, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. One is, uh, uh, that's funny. Uh, one of the, the second question was gonna be about soil type oh. as a determinant. So, <laughs> but the first question was about the tree rings, right? Yeah. And I, when I first plant a tree, can I ring it with a meter line? And then as the tree grows, can I just add additional circles? Is that a good philosophy? Is that worthwhile? Yeah, you know, I know, I know a contractor, a guy I actually worked with in, uh, in, in Valley Crest, uh, up in the, in the Bay Area. He's now out in, uh, in Utah, started his own company, a guy by the name of MJ Macias. And I remember uh, the first time I heard of using emitter line for tree rings was it was MJ and he said, Hey, the great thing is that when the tree's young, you can put one or two rings and as it grows, you can just start, you can keep on adding these rings uh, going further and further out. And I thought, oh, what a great idea. I think that's probably the best way to do it. It's more labor intensive, 
Um, I know a lot of guys who will just, you know, what's the maximum root zone going to be? We'll install the irrigation there up front. Uh, the labor cost to come back and do it is higher than the cost in water, so they end up doing it that way. So, uh, but I, I, I love the concept of adding uh, the rings as the trees mature. Yeah, I've seen a few contractors who actually use that concept and, and feel pretty uh, confident, you know, that it is good for the customer, it is good for the tree, mm -hmm. and they can build in that re recurring revenue into their plan each year, knowing that they have to go out and do a certain amount of uh, uh, increasing uh, emitter line around trees and it's revenue for them. Yeah. And I'll say, Hey, all the maintenance contractors that are out there. We all know that when it comes to installs, a lot of times it's low bid. So a lot of these guys to win the bid, they may not put enough irrigation out there. The maintenance guys, a quick revenue generating um, enhancement proposal, as well as increase the health of the landscape proposal is to come back and expand the irrigation system, especially in drip to, uh, to, to larger trees. And I, I've seen the benefits, not only from uh, enhanced opportunity for you know, your, your business, but also that the plant health is, uh, is increased as well. Well, and if I think about my landscape and I think about the most expensive investment I can make, it's in that tree. Absolutely. You know, and, it's funny. And, yeah. and, and the tree can also make maybe the biggest difference in the look of my landscape too. You know, one, one individual tree can make a huge impact. So uh, yeah, I want to be protecting my investment. Yeah, yeah, good point. Very good point. So it sounds like you were going to ask a question on how far apart emitters should be placed, right? Well, it just uh, soil is a determinate, uh, terminating factor of where do I place my emitters. Yeah, so in that, in that, in that uh, it's flip side of the same coin, you know, soil determining how far apart to place the emitters or how far apart do I place the emitters is determined by my soil type. Uh, and this is a general rule of thumb. Um, with sandy soil, I like to go 12 inch spacing. Uh, and you can see this illustrated here fairly well. A loamy soil, 16 to 18 inches, clay, 18 to 24, you know, really heavy clay um, on the 24 inch side. So. That uh, just general rule of thumb, and this holds true for both point source and emitter line. So that answers the question there. Um, now this gets into the, the the next section here. It's kind of the, the 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 more difficult, I think, thing that a lot of contractors struggle with, and that is how much water does my landscape need? And it really boils down to two questions: How long should I run my drip system? And how often should I run my drip system? I have seen, I had a neighbor, we've, uh, we've been in our house 10 years. This, this development was built about 10 years ago, almost 11 years ago. I have a neighbor who has not changed his controller since the day in November when the contractor installed it. <laughs> he has not changed his runtime at all. And he asked the other day, he's like, yeah, I'm watering it every day for about 15 minutes each day. Is that long enough? Yeah. <laughs> like, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going right. to send my, to my neighbor afterwards. <laughs> yeah. But I love that. It's not, is, is that too much? It's, is that long enough, is that right? Long enough, right? <laughs> Pour it on, more water. Yeah, but the, the question, how long do I run it and how often do I run it, right? So that first question, how long should I run my drip system? Um, and there are two key things we need to know in the dirt, the dirt, right? The dirt on dirt, it all comes back to the soil. We need to understand what's going on in the soil. The first thing we want to understand is how deep are the plant roots in the soil? You can see in this illustration, you got a perennial over here that's about maybe eight inches of root depth. Annuals might be, you know, six inches or so. And in the middle, we have a shrub there of some sort. We're looking at 12 to 18 inches of root depth. And then a mature tree, depending on the soil type and how compacted the soil is, those tree roots might be 18 inches to 36 inches in depth. So we want to understand where the roots are in the soil, okay? And then the second key thing of understanding, this goes back to just a couple slides ago on emitter spacing, but we, we also want to understand for how long I run my drip system is what kind of soil do I have? Yeah. Is it sand? Is it loam? Is it clay? And again, with a sandy soil, an inch of water will travel about 12 inches deep into a sandy soil. Uh, a moderate soil, a loamy soil, one inch of water might travel about six inches deep. And if you have a heavy clay soil, that one inch of, same one inch of water may only travel two inches deep. So you have to understand 
your root depth and what kind of soil you have to understand how much water you need to apply to get water into the root zone, okay? Um, natural question is how do I figure out what kind of soil do I have? Uh, I'm, I'm a, you, you could take a soil sample, send it off to a lab, pay about a hundred bucks and get the results. You can also take a, a mason jar, take a scoop of soil, put it in the mason jar, put some water in it, shake it vigorously, and then begin to let it settle. After 60 seconds, you draw a line, that's your sand. After an hour, you draw a line of what's settled, that's your silt. And after 24 hours, the remainder of the settled is the clay and you can figure out your percentage of sand, silt, clay. Google soil texture chart and then you can find out what kind of soil you have and um, go from there. And again, that's a, uh, Richard, that may be a webinar for another day on, uh, on that. So let's, let's get into a scenario here on how long I should run my drip system. If my plant roots are eight inches deep and I have a loam soil, which means one inch of water will travel about six inches, um, then um, I need to apply 1.33 inches of water to fill my root zone. And the way that um, comes up is if I take my, um, you know, one inch of water goes six inches deep and I divide six by eight, I get 1.33. So if I apply 1.33 inches of water to a loam soil, I will get water that goes eight inches deep. So, so to answer the question, how long do I run my drip system? Run at 1.33 inches of water, right? But, <laughs> I'm going to need my calculator for this, but I'm not sure where that button is. Yeah, right. So but that becomes the problem. You go back to uh, our section on emission devices. Um, these emission devices don't apply water in inches. Remember, the, the measurement here is gallons per hour. So that creates a conundrum. I, I want to apply, you know, 1.3 inches of water, but I have an emitter that's applying one gallon per hour. Luckily, there's a formula. And, uh, oh, there's my, my thinking. <laughs> Converting inches to gallons per hour. It, it, it is a formula. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause here. Anybody who wants to take a screenshot, this is being recorded and it'll be up on our website so you can come back as well. Uh, we're going to cover this in both emitter line and in point source. But for emitter line, we can convert inches to gallons per hour or gallons per hour to inches by knowing our flow in gallons per hour, spacing of emitters along the line, and then spacing between the rows. And that, that formula is 231 times Q, where Q is the flow in gallons per hour divided by S times L. S is emitter spacing, L is lateral spacing. So here's, here's the scenario here. I have a one gallon per hour emitter with an emitter every 12 inches along the line. And the lines are 12 inches apart. So I would take this formula, 231 times Q, which is one, divided by 12 times 12, which is my S and my L, my emitter spacing and my lateral spacing. So 231 times one is 231 divided by 12 times 12, which is 144, so it's 231 divided by 144, and I get 1.6 inches per hour. So with a 12 inch space, 12 inch lateral space, one gallon per hour emitter line grid, I am putting down 1.6 inches per hour of water. That becomes my conversion. So um, again, how long do I run my system then? And we can go back to this, this original scenario. I want to apply 1.3 inches of water. My system delivers 1.6 inches of water per hour. Uh, if I take that, do the math, right, divide it out, how long do I need to run my drip system? Well, it's going to be 50 minutes. Um, 0.83 hours, and you do the math, that's 50 minutes. So that's, that's the conversion of gallons per hour to inches, or I should say inches to gallon, and then you can do gallon to runtime. So uh, we determined uh, we want to apply 1.3 inches of water to fill a root zone eight inches deep in loam soil. I would want to run that for 50 minutes, uh, given I had a one gallon per hour emitter, 12 inch spacing by 12 inch spacing. And so Andy, in this situation, right, this would be for a particular time of the year based on ET, it would be different in the spring than in July, than in the fall. So really, <clears throat> we're going to be doing a lot of calculations out in the field, right, to get all this right. 
Well, yeah, and, and, and man, if your head is spinning right now, it's going to start spinning a lot, a lot more. I haven't even gotten into frequency yet. I'm just talking about how long do I run just to put water in the root zone, right? Okay. And, and, uh, and, and that's, that is, uh, it, 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 with your, your question gets into frequency. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to frequency here in just a second. That's a really good question. So it's a, it's a, a great uh, um, segue into uh, what's going to come. But real quick, I, I do want to just, point out for point source emitter the same the formula is very similar but uh and i, I won't go through all the calculations here but it, the uh the formula ends up being you have 231 times q which is your flow again in gallons per hour divided by your area of coverage and this is where you need to know a little bit of basic geometry you know pi r squared your radius of a circle um your wetted diameter this is a, if you have a point source emitter and it's on the ground how wide is that diameter, that circle that is wetted? That's uh, that's the number we're looking for. That's our area of coverage, and so that uh, that that's the formula we use there. So, but but then you get into uh, your question, Richard, which is okay. You you told me how long I need to run my drip system, but do I run it every day? Do I run it once a week? Or do I run it once a month? You know, how is the frequency right? How often do I run it? And the key to this one is, and this is, uh, again, I'm just give you a warning up front. If your head, head is spinning now, it's, it's about to spin a little bit faster. <laughs> but this is good information, I hope. Uh, the key to all this is evapotranspiration, right? And evapotranspiration is a measurement of how much water is evaporated from the soil and how much water is transpired, transpiration from the plant. Combined together, that's how much water is being lost from the soil. And there's uh, some, some key, five key factors that affect that temperature, humidity, solar radiation, wind velocity, and the type of plant. Now, everybody knows that the plant, my, my turf grass in, in February needs a lot less water than my uh, turf grass does, you know, the, the, the end of June. And that's because temperatures are higher, there's the sun's stronger, um, probably more wind, you know, the plant's growing faster that time of year. So all those factors begin to affect um, ET. So again, let's go back to that question. How often should I run my drip system? Um, we, ET is key here, and we know that ET is, a, is measured in inches of water as well. So this is, this is a, 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 um, a scientific measure that's measured in inches of water. And I, I'm going to use Las Vegas for example here. Um, I took the last seven days in Las Vegas. It's approximate. I didn't add it up. I just I rounded some numbers. Um, the last seven days, ET or evapotranspiration in Vegas was 1.4 inches. I took each daily total, added them up, and so I got 1.4 inches. So that's 1.4 inches, one time per week, or I could divide it by twice a week, you know, 0.7 inches, or I could do it on five times per week. So I could measure that weekly, daily, however I wanted to do it, right? So again, I'm trying to figure out how long, long I want to run my drip system. And uh, if we're putting down, we want to put down 1.33 inches of water to fill my root zone eight inches. And I know that every seven days I'm using 1.4 inches of water. We do the math, we divide that out 1.33 divided by 1.4, convert that into days. And I end up with the need to irrigate every six and a half days. Richard, I lose you. No, nope, still had a little freeze there for a second, but so that's a lot. That's a lot of calculations, right? And I'm I'm going uh, to my next job. Um, you know, uh, this makes it tough. So there's got to be an easier way, right, Andy. I, I just programming all the controllers to 20 minutes a day, four days a week. Absolutely, and it's not just that. It's the weather changes hourly weather changes daily. I mean, this, this was one snapshot in time and it could change, I mean, it could change on an hourly basis. And, and like I said, if you think your head is spinning now, it's gonna, it, it gets even, even, even worse. There is an alternative. You could do these calculations. We live in a day of technology. Why not let technology work for you? Um, you could use one simple ET water smart controller. And this is a smart controller that's taking into account your plant material. 
that's taking into account your soil type, your root depth, your precipitation rate, temperature, humidity, wind velocity, plus, you know, there's 17 factors total is taking into account and it's monitoring this on an hourly basis and making adjustments every single day to your controller. It takes all the guesswork out of it for you. So you can, uh, I, this was a little bit of a setup. Let me show you something that makes your head spin thinking there's no way I can ever manage my irrigation. I give up. Well, um, there is a solution. <laughs> it is a smart controller. Yeah. So, uh, and so I love it, right? Because um, it, it is difficult to, um, you know, take the time, right? Everybody can, can learn the math and can learn the process and know where to get the information, but actually taking the time to do that and then driving to every controller and making the changes, uh, this is, uh, this would be really difficult, right? Uh, nearly impossible uh, considering the cost of that. So, um, so that, that's, uh, that is a great solution, right? And uh, one show we can really save people a lot of, a lot of so, <clears throat> so the questions uh, I have is the uh, whole, whole concept of soil depletion. Does this affect the, uh, the frequency? So you're breaking up a little bit. You talk, uh, the question is, does soil depletion affect, affect uh, frequency? Yeah. So how does the soil depletion affect the frequency? Yeah. So as you know, that's, it, it is a good question. So you, as, as water is depleted from the root zone in the soil, the soil root zone more quickly, it needs to be replaced more often. And with these smart controllers specifically, you can set a depletion level. Um, typically that's 50% at uh, 50% depletion in the soil. I want to hit a trigger event and I'm going to, have another watering cycle to fill that root zone back up to what we call field capacity, 100% full. Uh, I know some, some guys are, are going at 30% depletion. Some are trying to push it out a little bit more. Um, if you have a really efficient uh, drip system or irrigation system, a really well-designed irrigation system, you can probably push that even beyond 50%. But um, that 50% depletion seems to be the key. And, you know, go, going back to the savings, Richard, you know, you could, as a contractor, employ uh, 100 people to run these numbers and go around and make these changes on a daily basis. Uh, or you can employ one guy that is managing, you know, three or 400 controllers. And you start to, uh, you start to do the, the co cost benefit analysis, you know, labor being the single biggest direct expense for landscape contractors. Uh, you know, you save a lot of money letting the technology work for you. Right, right. And uh, we, we did have somebody uh, uh, mention that uh, most uh, ET controllers do not have a soil moisture depletion component. We're happy to say that the uh, Jane Unity uh, does. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about that software. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, you know, I'm... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with some of the other smart controllers out there, but I would say if, if your smart controller doesn't have the soil moisture depletion component, you probably need that because again, it's, it's as much as smart controllers look at the weather, um, they look at the plant material, the secret to all of this, um, and this goes back to how long I need to run my irrigation, how frequently I need to do it. The, the secret to it all is the soil. The soil holds the key to our irrigation. As the water holding capacity is the root depth. Uh, you need to understand what's going on in the soil. If you don't know how much water you have in your soil, um, it's really become, it becomes really tough to manage that. So having having that is key. That's one of the key things I like about Unity is that uh, the moisture balance. I can see very quickly the moisture balance in my soil, and as an irrigation manager, that becomes a key metric for uh, for making decisions as I uh, as I manage irrigation. Yeah. So, Andy, this has been great. You've really helped all of us get a better uh, grip on 
one of the things that uh, we've been adding to the webinars and make them uh, a little bit more fun is to learn a little bit more about you and, and your experience. And so uh, I call these uh, my uh, rapid questions, okay? okay. So uh, first question I have is, uh, you know, do you have a favorite book about water management or irrigation? Well, so uh, I'm going to say two things on that. First, uh, if, you're, if you are looking for a quick uh, how-to practical application uh, drip knowledge, I'm going to recommend, and it's, it's free download on our website, it's the Jane Contractor Design Guide, and it is drip irrigation basics. We call it Contractor Design Guide equally applicable to homeowners, but it's got some good drip irrigation basics. I like that. And then the next thing I'll mention is, is the, uh, I know Richard, you and I were talking uh, yesterday. I, uh, the next book I'm going to read is uh, The Big Thirst, um, partly because I, I've heard what, what a good book it is, but I know uh, you were mentioning that, uh, you know, they're talking a lot about some of the water conservation things that were done in Vegas. Of course, I, uh, native Nevada and love my hometown. I, I mean, I'm interested to, to see how that was reported as well. So I'd say two, two, two right there, uh, the Jane Contractor Design Guide for Practical Application, and then the next on my list is uh, Big Thirst, just about water uh, in general. Yeah, Charles Fishman did a great job on that. And I think 130 colleges across the country for, uh, for incoming freshmen, so. Uh, Great choices. So next question, uh, Andy, um, what do you think the biggest obstacle facing the water management industry is today and what, what can we do about it? Oh boy. Um, you know, I, there, there's a lot of contractors out there who don't care. Um, there, there's guys who, who pretend to be water managers and they do it so they can sell something. You take smart controllers, for example. They want to sell smart controllers for revenue recognition without ever having the intent of managing the water to save money. And I, sometimes I, I, I think that, so the, the biggest obstacle becomes two people. Number one, it's education. Number two, it's contractors, I think, who uh, just don't care. Now, solution to that is um, education. I think property managers, boards of directors, the guy who's paying the water bill, the more educated they are, the more they'll be able to differentiate between um, bad contractor versus good contractor. Every landscape contractor has seen this. We all know the proper way to plant a tree. We all know the proper way to irrigate. We, we know there's a right way to do things, yet we're constantly battling the guys who don't care about doing it the right way. They just want to make a quick buck. Um, that challenge, it comes back to education, more educated, the, uh, not just the workforce, but the end uh, user, the decision makers are the guy paying the water bill, the more educated they are, the more we can help them understand uh, and differentiate between quality, uh, superior quality and inferior quality. I think the, the, the better chance we give ourselves to uh, see some real gains in water conservation. Yeah. That's good, Andy. Thank you. And finally, what's, what's your favorite plant to grow there in your home state of Nevada? Oh, man. There's so, um, depending on the time of year. Right now, so I'm, I was uh, out last night picking some peaches. I got to get, get busy tonight before the birds get them. Peaches, uh, we, we were able to, believe it or not, in Vegas grow peaches. I love, I love, uh, I love that. Um, favorite perennial, I'm going to say, because I got a beautiful one growing right now, is uh, blue salvia. Um, but, you know, lately, when, when I get a chance to remodel my yard, my front yard, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's time to, to make some changes. I've been a big fan of natives lately. Um, golden barrel cactus, some, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the native flowers, pension, and some of these others that grow around here native that are filled with color and require very little water. Um, you know, I live on the edge of the desert. It amazes me. Uh, up until about a month ago, I could walk out in the desert and it looked like somebody okay. just... Uh, um, it lit the desert on fire with color. It was so beautiful, so vibrant, and it's such an arid environment. We get maybe three inches of rain a year that, that uh, you know, these plants could grow and look so, so beautiful. So I'm, uh, I, I'd like to add some more of those. I know that's a, you're asking me to pick a favorite. I don't have a favorite. So I, hopefully I have a lot of favorites. <laughs> yeah. Well, the ones you mentioned are, are really 
guys' plants and uh, uh, really exciting that you're able to grow them in uh, Nevada. So anyway, I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us today. And uh, thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, you really did help a lot of people get a, a better configuration and how best to install it and use it. And uh, that's very um, again, like Andy had mentioned, we've got the webinar series now on the Jane website. You can just uh, search Jane webinars and you'll see uh, all, all the webinars that we've uh, recorded. Uh, and by the way, this Friday, uh, we're going to have the uh, largest Jane Logic uh, ag user uh, in the nation on as a guest. And we're going to be talking to him about uh, how he's using Jane Logic to uh, maximize yields and reduce costs on his uh, farms. And then uh, in the next week, we've got John Farner coming on from the Irrigation Association on Wednesday. And he's going to talk about what the IA is doing to help all of us during these uh, uh, usual times that we're experiencing. So again, thanks everybody for checking in. And Andy, great job today. Uh, thank you so much for being on. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks.